Hey, good afternoon, everyone. It is 3.02, so we want to go on and get started. One second. Okay, perfect. Before I mess up one of my speaker slides. Okay, I got it back in place. We're good. Okay, we'll go on and get started. We only have 50 minutes for this session. Um, so I want to make sure that we have time for our panelist presentation as well as Q&A. So for those of you I have not met yet, my name is Annalise Lim. I'm one of the senior youth and HIV advisors at the Office of HIV in Washington um, at headquarters. And welcome to the session on creating an enabling environment for youth. Um, before I introduce our three panelists today, I would like to discuss just a little on how we chose our session title. Um, some of you were in the technical guidance session for priority populations, and you heard my colleague Elizabeth speak about positive youth development. And many of you know that positive youth development, or PYD, is USAID's approach to youth programming. So PYD engages youth along with their families, communities, and governments so that youth are empowered to reach their full potential. A positive youth development approach builds assets, skills, competencies, it fosters healthy relationships, it strengthens the environment, and it can transform systems. There are four critical components of positive youth development which you also were introduced to if you were in the last session. One of these are assets, which are the necessary resources, skills, and competencies that youth need to achieve desired outcomes. A second component is agency, which allows youth to both perceive and actually have the ability to employ their assets and aspirations to make or influence decisions about their lives and to act on those decisions. As part of PYD, we also have contribution. This is when youth are encouraged to be recognized and engaged as a source of change for their own and their community's well-being. And can anyone guess what the fourth domain is? Look at the session title. <laughs> Enabling environments. You had too many cakes at tea break, I can tell, or not enough. So the fourth domain is enabling environment, which ensures that youth are surrounded by an environment that maximizes their assets, promotes their agency, and provides access to services and opportunities. An enabling environment mitigates risk and allows youth to stay safe, secure, and protected, promoting their social and emotional competence to thrive. So I think you'll see our three presentations today actually cut across the four domains, but all three of them really speak to creating an enabling environment for youth. And so while this is an AGYW Dreams panel, I think you will find the programs, the lesson learned, or applicable to any of your adolescent and youth programmings across the cascade. So I'm going to introduce our three speakers all at once. I encourage you to read their full bios in the conference materials. Um, they will each give a brief presentation and then we'll have questions and answer. So one of our panelists is Anne Schley. She is the chief of party for CHAMP and with Mothers to Mothers in South Africa. We also have Victoria Munthali with Manasso from Malawi. Victoria has two hats as both the m &E lead and program management. And we also have Adit Kumbe, who is with Nweti in Mozambique, and Adit is a Dream Senior Officer. Thank you all for joining us, and I will ask Anne if she would come and start with the first presentation. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. I'm gonna actually try and do this with written antiquated notes. Okay, so today, I'm gonna kickstart this. Okay, I'll be presenting a study that was conducted by Mothers to Mothers uh, as part of our Children and Adolescents Are My Priority Project, 
We are located in Mpumalanga province, South Africa. Mpumalanga borders Mozambique and Eswatini. It has high rates of HIV, unemployment, gender-based violence, all of which particularly affects adolescent um, girls and young women. So to address these particular problems, um, our project implements uh, multiple packages of evidence-based interventions in the communities for uh, orphans and vulnerable children from a zero to 17, adolescents included. Um, and <clears throat> the, the parenting, proven parenting interventions are just one of three OVC program models that we do deliver. So under the DREAMS, OVC DREAMS uh, Family Strengthening uh, Program component, we are implementing Parenting for Lifelong Health uh, as one of our curricula. It was developed by University of Oxford in tandem with WHO and UNICEF, and it seeks to reduce abuse uh, amongst children and adolescents <clears throat> in the home and also increase the well-being generally of vulnerable families. So, in 2020, amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, which I'm still uh, slightly traumatized from, <laughs> and still lurking with us, right? Uh, we did immediately, due to national lockdown, severe restrictions on uh, movement in South Africa, our team recognized there was a real need for more flexible, contextualized, but still scalable interventions uh, to reach and retain not only adolescents in these parenting interventions, but also really the caregivers. Um, who I think across the board, especially when we talk about dreams or dreams family strengthening, have been, um, I think, definitely difficult and, and, and challenging to, to, to reach and um, retain as part of these programs. So <clears throat> we looked at uh, really ways we could uh, address these challenges and partnered with University of Oxford. And as part of a broader research study, we examined the implementation and the effectiveness of two versions of the parenting curriculum, Parenting for Lifelong Health. So we looked at difference in effects between two groups, um, 291 pairs of AGYW and caregivers who received the original in-person. This is 14 sessions, all in-person, 10 of which uh, the, the pairs are combined. They both receive the dosage at the same time. Four sessions are facilitated just with the caregivers and adolescents. We compared this to a digital adaptation that has been developed by Oxford, our University of Oxford, called Parent Chat. Uh, it's 12 sessions in total, eight of which are de uh, delivered via WhatsApp to caregivers only, using audio, video, illustrated comics, really quite innovative content. The other four sessions are delivered actually in person for both adolescents and caregivers. So it was more like a blended approach. Um, the effects uh, that were analyzed were on pr the primary outcome was child maltreatment. And then <clears throat> we looked at effects or differential effects between these two groups on a range of secondary outcomes. Uh, including but not limited to parental involvement and risk avoidance uh, behaviors. And we used a pre-post uh, pre test methodology and also a difference in difference analysis. I can't even see my own slide. I'm getting old. <laughs> this is a summary of the demographics of participants. You'll see um, more or less some similarity between the EPLH, which is the parent chat group, and the, um, the PLH, which is the original and uh, mainly female caregivers, and the mean age of the adolescent participants was approximately 13. Um, the study de design did use a uh, pre-post surveys um, that really drew from validated screening tools and measures. I'll give an example. Um, I think it was Alabama Parenting Questionnaire, for example, that measured parenting involvement. I uh, certainly did not do the statistical analysis that was done by Oxford, but if anyone is interested in more granular information about the trial, uh, the broader research protocol, or any of the, um, the measures that were used, I can provide that either by email or it's online. <clears throat> so, and these measures were uh, administered over approximately eight months. Uh, they were embedded into the WhatsApp uh, modalities and also delivered in person by uh, professional social workers that we employed. So overarchingly, the uh, results showed a decrease in child mal maltreatment as the primary outcome, both for PLH and for parent chat. However, the, the difference in difference analysis showed an enhanced decrease for parent chat. So what I've done here is I've shown you now a, uh, a table that really summarizes the difference in difference analysis. The pre-post the pre testing showed effect for both the hybrid and the face-to-face on the primary and all the secondary. But when we did the difference in difference, 
The yellow shows where the hybrid, quote, scored higher, and the blue shows where the face-to-face -face actually came out stronger in terms of effect. So again, this is a small sample size, right? But the, this suggests evidence that the hybrid approach, in this case, a blended WhatsApp um, digital technology does, does have some success and does have effect. So just in sum, I think, <clears throat> Really, the uh, primary outcome showed, as, as, as shown, more um, significant decrease in, in child maltreatment. The other thing that was analyzed was predictors of caregiver um, attendance using some of the de demographic and baseline um, reports from caregivers around certain variables. Um, interestingly enough, uh, parents who attended, or caregivers who attended parent, uh, parent chat who had less financial security actually um, their attendance was higher, and this then had an, a greater effect or increased the effect of the outcomes. Um, where caregivers, for example, demonstrated more support or promoted education of their child in the household, the effect of their outcomes decreased. And then lastly, another barrier and a predictor of attendance was actually when caregivers had an adolescent with a child of their own in the home, and this decreased their participation. It also then, the attendance was decreased and, and reduced the effect of the outcomes. No other predictors of attendance um, certainly were, uh, were seen to uh, you know, have a moderate, moderating effect. So in some, ooh, I've timed well. <laughs> so in some, the hybrid version actually does show some promise, but obviously requires more testing, and um, I think it could be an an alternative to scaling up some of these parenting interventions, certainly in resource settings, and um, shows a good example. Time is up, but I did want to thank my AOR, um, Annika Diamond and Anita Sampson at the Mission for championing this and allowing us to take the space. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Edith Kumbe. I'm from Nweti, Mozambique. Um, we will serve me because my first language is Portuguese, not English. So I'll take time to explain so you, uh, you can serve for that. Um, I will speak about the uh, experience that Nweti have been implementing on social and economic strengthening. In two provinces, we have been implementing DREAMS uh, since 2015. Um, and from since in the COP20, we started with this approach of social and economic strengthening in two provinces, Gaza and Zambezia provinces. So I've been talking, I will be talking about the experiences that we have in implementing this new component. Um, just to give uh, an overview, uh, just to say that uh, to start this uh, approach of social and economic strengthening, first uh, we did a, a marketing assess assessment for the, this activity in these uh, two provinces. Um, the, USAID team previously have explained it that uh, uh, we have primary package and the secondary package, so the social and economic strengthening, uh, it's uh, implementing in the secondary packages in, in DREAMS. So after uh, our girls uh, uh, finish the social, and asset, social asset building sessions, they go to some activities which include uh, edu educational subsidies, including saving groups, including vocational training courses, including also provision to, of startup uh, and kit, kits for their business, and also to create uh, uh, associations. And we also facilitate them to assess uh, to internships. Uh, the main results that we achieved in COP21 with uh, this approach uh, was first uh, we established 
we, with uh, uh, collaboration with eight vocational training institutes in these uh, uh, two provinces. Uh, we reached 1,282 uh, participants who graduated from uh, uh, vocational, co vocational courses. Uh, this training, uh, we started with, with uh, uh, cooking, uh, with uh, accountability, with uh, um, uh, sewing, but then one of the lessons that we learned was that we, we tried to, to challenge the, these girls to choose uh, those not common courses for girls. So in the second phase uh, of uh, our trainings, uh, uh, we did a motivational day. We had an open motivational day where the girls could choose and they could have information about another courses like uh, plumbing, like electricity, and some courses that they were not very familiar with or were not the common sense for girls. Uh, another main result uh, that we had was 280 girls receiving uh, startup grants and uh, one, three, 135 participants in internships. So we also had implemented eight, uh, had 80 business associations created for these AGYW uh, 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 girls. Uh, the main lessons that we had from this implementation, I think one of the thing, one one of the main lessons that we have is that uh, the memorandum of understanding that we we signed with these local partners, uh, private partners, to to make them to uh, girls to have access access to these internships to these trainings. One of the strategies that we used was to have one day for. Uh, um, the uh, uh, social uh, sexual harassment uh, uh, session so that we could prepare these uh, uh, partners, private partners and government partners also to have access to this information and to be able and to ensure that these girls could be protected ag against uh, uh, prevention and, and sexual harassment. Uh, another lesson that we have from these implementations is related to uh, partnership with small artisans. I need to tell that uh, it's very expensive to implement this uh, 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 social and economic approach. For example, for one girl, it costs around 370 US dollars for one girl to complete all the packages. So one of the strategies that we uh, decided to implement was to involve the local artisans in the communities, not only the formal uh, training institutions. So having access to, the, to these local artisans, we, have to, we, we had the opportunity to slow, the, to cut the costs of, uh, uh, the costs of, of these uh, trainings. Uh, another lesson that uh, uh, we can share uh, is the fact that uh, one of the things that we learned from the social and economic uh, strengthening, it, it's one approach that contributes to uh, re to retention the girls to re retain the girls in the dreams programs. So we think that investing on trainings, investing on the creating a local associations where these girls can uh, start implementing the activities, it, it's something that we need to uh, invest uh, uh, on. Thank you. And Okay, uh, good afternoon once again. I'm Victoria, I'm from Manaso in Malawi. That's a Malawi network of eight service organizations. So I'll just share a bit of our project that we are working on. It's called Pamodzi. Um, and it's mainly looking at engaging communities and local structures for local solutions to local problems. So to do that, we have a number of objectives that we're working on. And I'll just 
dwell mainly on the one that is looking at engaging the communities, which includes the youth. Uh, we are in three districts, uh, mainly targeting the youth, 15 to 24 years, and women of childbearing um, ages. So how are we engaging these youth? Mainly we are doing community scorecards, um, which for Pamodzi, it takes three days to do the process, where firstly you put the target groups in, in groups, like focus group discussions, where they'll discuss various themes that are provided that are presumed to be of concern. So we have groups for adult males, adult females, and then the youths also have their own groups uh, in which they'll sit and discuss issues. On the second day, whatever they have discussed, they will prioritize the issues and give them scores um, out of a certain mark in terms of how they're assessing that particular issue. We also have similar groups for the healthcare workers where we're assessing issues to do with healthcare services. And then on the final day, there's an interface session where all concerned parties sit in one place and dissect each of the issues that have been uh, identified. And then they are prioritized according to which one is uh, predominant or which one is more critical. And all the parties have to agree on one score uh, to say maybe indeed healthcare workers are not behaving well or communities have an issue because all the parties will bring up the issues. And the youth are also part of that group. They will bring their results. And together, they will come up with a plan in terms of how those issues should be um, resolved. Um, so basically, that's the process that is taken. And that's how the youth are engaged in, how, in, in identifying problems and solutions to their problems. So that's just one of the sessions. Uh, we can see the youth in their groups and an interface session. So it's quite a big crowd that is part of that. Just to show an example of some of the issues that have been identified, um, looking also at the balance that the issues that are talked about are not just um, accusing the healthcare workers or the communities, but it's a balance of both issues. And the scores are coming from a common ground where all the communities and healthcare workers have agreed that this is an issue and these are the reasons. So the rationale behind the issue is also supposed to be clear because from that then you um, develop the proposed solutions for those issues. So once uh, those issues have been identified, that's another example of how now each issue or theme or indicator, depending on how you call it, is supposed to be dissected. So you have an issue, you have a score that is agreed upon, the reasons why you have given that score for that particular issue, and then the proposed solution to that issue. And then who are you ad ad uh, addressing that to, or who is who are you... Uh, going to advocate for that solution. So all those issues have to be clear because out of that, then you have to come up with a committee who are going to be following up on all those issues that have been identified to make sure that the proposed solutions are indeed going to be um, implemented on. And then another thing is that the timelines also have to be made clear because those are the timelines that you'll be coming forth and checking if indeed these have been done. So for the youth themselves, they have also been made part of these committees. In the past, that was a problem that the youths were being part of the identifying the issues, but they were not part of the committees to follow up on these issues. So that has been the process that we have used. Uh, we have started seeing some improvements or some results from that. We have seen some condom distribution points being um, increased in the communities, youth-friendly health service rooms being allocated for the youth, and even some partners coming in to assist where there were some gaps, uh, like we have seen FIPAM coming in to help with self-testing condoms, uh, sorry, self-testing kits and condoms. 
I just to mention that these scorecard sessions, because we're also targeting institutions of higher learning, we're also doing this within the institutions. So that same process is also taken on board and followed through. So where the partners are also coming in also helps a lot. Um, so once those things have been done, we're also seeing even some impacts for that. Uh, we have seen, we can attribute some of these results to the scorecards because where you have additional condoms, where we have youth-friendly health services, we are also seeing increased um, testing amongst the youth uh, across the quarters in the districts that we have been in. We have some lessons uh, that we are learned across the time uh, where we have seen that there's interest from the youth from the communities to take part. They just need to be given uh, opportunities and some of those uh, that have been highlighted. Some of the challenges, I have a few seconds so I can speak on those. We have seen that there's over delegation uh, especially where you need the district management teams, seeing that the issues are mainly concerned with health facilities themselves, so they'll end up delegating a lot and not really the people who are in decision-making positions. So with that, we have learned that planning in advance is quite critical because the districts are quite busy, so they need to be informed in advance so that they can equally plan and include us in that uh, plan so that when the interface session comes through, then they are available to sometimes even provide uh, solutions right there on the spot so that we don't have to wait for long. With that, my time is up, so thank you very much. This might be the first uh, group of panelists that all finished their presentation <laughs> in the allotted amount of time. So a big round of applause. Um, I'm, I'm going to get pointers from you all afterwards because you'd have left us with a full 20 minutes of Q&A. So th another round of applause for Anna, Deet, and Victoria. Great, so the floor is open. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. And oh my gosh, we'll be busy. You have lots of water for answers. Um, if you have a question for a specific panelist or for everyone, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kiri Malijani from Hope Worldwide, Botswana. I have a question for, thank you very much for the great presentations, by the way, and the successes that you are sharing. Um, I have a question for mother, Mothers to Mothers on the implementation of Sinobuyo. Um, what were the key challenges, especially um, around working with caregivers who are working, who, who are engaged in? Um, because, and, and I would say, what is your recommendation to a project that's struggling, especially with um, having the pairs together all the time? For Nweti, um, how did you handle the startups? Did you have um, one size fits all in terms of uh, funding, or was it on merit? Thank you very much. We'll take one more question, and then we'll have the panelist answer. And then another round. <laughs> yeah, congratulations for presentations. My question goes to my neighbor from Mozambique. Um, in your presentation, you said that sometimes you advise the girls to take some more challenging uh, career, which they are, which are not common. So my concern is, um, what is the community attitude toward demanding their services after graduation? Let's see, Anne, would you, do we have our second microphone now? Super, I have a pretty, pretty yes. Um, yes, okay. And we'll have to use the mic so that they can hear us online as well. Let me use this one. And sorry, for our question for our um, Mozambique colleague, could you repeat that one more time for us? 
Yes, um, in her presentation, she said that uh, sometimes they advise the girls to take some career path which are not common, for example, plumbing, electricity, and so on and so forth. And my question is, after graduating from the courses, what is the attitude of the communi communities toward really demanding their services? Fantastic question, by the way, around caregivers and challenges, because I, I don't think it's unique to our context. Again, as I mentioned, I think this is um, very emblematic, right, of the, of the bigger picture. Um, some things that we did, and I, I don't think this is uh, revolutionary, but we were as flexible as possible looking at after hours, weekend sessions with caregivers, um, makeup sessions, and really being as uh, person-centered as possible, you know, in terms of their scheduling. Looking at uh, evidence-based incentives, Tulane University did an excellent paper on the use of vouchers as an example, but we really kind of did ongoing formative research around which incentives were acceptable, um, where uh, food parcels is an example. Um, we also incentivized uh, the caregivers a little bit with an extra data, so we did provide data to the caregivers and the facilitators, and we did not provide phones. We chose a peri-urban area through our informal landscape analysis that we were pretty sure all households or the majority had at least one phone to share. And then I would say just advocacy, right? Um, we worked hard with USA here and also in OGAC to really get this approved. I mean, they wanted, OGAC wanted us to do everything in person during the pandemic. And so it was a real ongoing conversation, both with the curriculum developers, the mission, and OGAC to say, we need something that's more contextualized, that you know, we need something that's more of a blended hybrid approach. and. I, I personally did it with existing resources. I integrated and tested this as part of my implementation, so it didn't cost anything. And I, and I um, anything extra in terms of uh, the data collection, and we used a, um, an uh, open, um, open server called ODK, I, I motivated for cost share. So there was no reprogramming. So I would say continue to look for opportunities to integrate it as part of implementation so we continue to build on the evidence base. That would be my recommendation. Not easy. For the first one uh, related to startup kids, I need to start saying that uh, it's very expensive to to implement these startup kids activity. We have to to make sure of that. And one of the challenges that we faced is that we were working with um, uh, government institutions, uh, training government institutions. So. Uh, the first challenge that we had is how to ensure that these in, uh, government institutions have access and uh, have all the uh, startup kits. So it was a big challenge. One of the strategies uh, that we used was to create the associations at community level, which means that, uh, for example, if we if we train. Uh, uh, 30 girls from the sa same area, we, we, we will gi give the, these girls or as association, they will have one startup kit and they will work together. That's, that was one of the strategies that we used uh, to, to make sure that all the girls have access to that startup kit. But it's, it's very, very expensive, so now we are trying to look for another strategy to, to how to implement this approach of giving one startup kit for one year. It's not possible. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the next question of um, how to handle with the uh, non-common training or courses in the community. Uh, one of, one of the, the lessons that we, we learned is first the parents were how can our, um, our girls, how can our children can, for this example, be trained on the plumbing. It's not common to see a girl uh, doing this kind of job in the community. But at the same time, having the, them as the first girls in the community, it was a big motivation for other girls in the communities and also motivation for their parents. Now is the community who ask for the job uh, uh, from these girls. So it means that uh, uh, it's, it means a lot for them. So I think 
we can also have the, the challenge, uh, a culture barrier, but at the same time with the uh, sessions and the motivation that we give to the parents, at the same time, they say, oh, wow, our girls can also do this work. I think that's the big lesson. Thank you. Okay, next round of questions. Okay, thank you. Um, mine is uh, for the Sinovio, Parenting for Lifelong. Um, two questions. Uh, the first thing, I just wanted to know from your study, did you find that the hybrid model, which had the online platform, did in it increase any male involvement? Because I think it's a programming gap where we don't have a lot of males in our parenting programs. Then number two is how did you manage the issue of um, reporting, looking at the issues around registers? I think for me, that's the two questions. Thank you. Thank you. Another couple of questions we'll take. Thank you. Mine is to Mozambique, and apologies for my voice. I'm struggling a little bit. <coughs> Looking at the number of girls that have completed vocational training is quite commendable. And uh, we find that when we did our labor market assessment, we did s uh, different typologies of the girls. And the ones that would access the formal VTC vocational training centers were really ty our type four girls that have dropped out of education and so how did you manage to get so many girls? And what are the requirements of your vocational training centers? Thank you. Thank you. I'll take one more. Do one of you have a question on our community scorecard presentation? Because I want to make sure we cover all areas. If not, I will ask mine. OK, that's the perk of being a moderator. So for the community scorecards, you mentioned at one point that youth were very involved with the actual scorecard, but they hadn't been on the follow-up committee, I believe is the name, and then you had youth join. So I'm curious, were there other parts of the community scorecard process where you saw increased youth engagement and that made a difference? Okay, and I will turn it back to our panelists. Thank you, and great, another great question about male involvement, male caregivers. It's um, unfortunately, no, that analysis wasn't done as part of this uh, particular pilot or study. And as you probably saw, it was 96%, right, female caregivers. It's one thing we're trying to really change with um, more intentional, intensified focus on caregivers this implementing year and really looking at the strategy of creating caregiver ambassadors, just like our dreams ambassadors, to achieve that goal. In terms of reporting, Another great question. Um, really trying to, well, in our case, leveraging partnerships. Great partnership with University of Oxford, uh, implementing resource partner uh, here on the ground called Clowns Without Borders. So already they w had provided some training to our staff um, you know, to deliver the in-person. And, and because they were doing this broader study with 1,900 participants all throughout Africa, we were able to leverage a lot of their um, their inputs and, and, and additional training, you know, at very low cost or for free. Um, then we had, you know, it's sometimes how you manage your internal team and your subpartners. Zoe Life is one of our subpartners on our consortium. They're, they are small but mighty. Their SI team actually, because we've introduced this tablet technology, they were the ones to recommend this open access server. They digitized the survey links. We had some that were administered in person, but really, you know, um, too, I, I, I worked with uh, University of Oxford to, to truly ensure that the sample size and the subset, our contribution, was reasonable and feasible. I wanted it to complement um, implementation, definitely not disrupt. And again, for me, it's we really, I'd like to continue to try and integrate some of the other digital adaptations and maybe compare the two, like especially parent text, which is even less resource intensive. It's not just a push messaging. It has, it's again, quite innovative con content. So for this implementing year, I'd like to do that. And, and it's the same thing. I plan early with the team. I make sure I have resources through interns, as an example. We now have a Peace Corps response volunteer. So double down in SI in creative ways, yeah, and make it happen. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> All right. Um, so the scorecard sessions that we have had are the first round. Um, but what we have noticed in terms of, 
additional involvement outside of the process itself. Um, maybe just to take you back a bit, because with the program we have ambassadors that are in the communities who are interacting more with the other youths. So now what we have seen is that because the community scorecard process itself is quite lengthy and it can be costly, so in terms of the, the themes that we discuss at a time, is quite limited. So we only choose those that we feel probably need more interventions. So now what we have seen is that more youths are now approaching the ambassadors to request for certain themes to be tackled on the next scorecard session. So apart from the participation during the actual scorecard and the follow-up, this has been the other component that we have seen that they are now actually coming to request for certain themes to be discussed in the upcoming scorecard session, but also to make sure that we are giving feedback. Uh, so we, where the next cycle has not come yet, making sure that the ambassadors are going back and giving them feedback. Where are we? What have we done now? What are the next steps as we wait for the next scorecard session? So I think for now, that's what we have noticed. Thank you. Um, on the question related to <laughs> the requirements, um, just to give a little bit of context, we are implementing in 17 districts in Mozambique. So one of the province, which is Zambezia district, it's a large province, so we have uh, 12 districts and uh, in another province, five districts. So uh, in terms of uh, uh, requirements, um, of course, we have uh, we use the, the dreams requirements first, but they also um, to select the most vulnerable girls to, to go to the, the trainings. But uh, before uh, 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 they start the vocational trainings, also they they fill out a form or our partner uh, 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 make the girls uh, uh, makes an assessment. To, to 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 check and to see if the g these girls have the criteria to go to these trainings. Of course, we have dropouts. That's clear. Some of them uh, can start and cannot finish because we are during the pandemic we have the high mobility. But uh, one of the things one of the things that we are trying to work on now is how to select the most vulnerable girls who need to do all this package. But we, we follow the uh, DREAMS criteria before they start. We also um, uh, may, uh, uh, um, check the criteria so and, uh, and, uh, and the local team also goes to see these girls to, to select uh, according to the criteria that they have. Sorry? Yes, yes, they also have the requirements to, to go to the vocational trainings. I can explain I can explain after the session what are the requirements. Thank you. Okay, we have time for another round of questions. Let me come to the these three here. Okay. Thank you so much for the presentations. My question is to Nweti. How do I know policies and laws differ per country, but I wonder if you don't have a situation where there is issues of workman compensation expected for the girls to when you want to take them into certain internship um, areas, especially in the areas where there is um, like missionary use. How, how do you deal with those kind of situations? Missionary, sorry, yes. like Mi machinery uses where the employ the, the companies will be expecting you to have those girls in short for compens workmen compensation because they're not employees. You're asking for internship. Right. Yes. Okay. So around compensation as well as insurance yes. because they're not maybe full time employees. They're internships. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, presentations. My mine is more of a comment around ES. Um, I think you s um, y when you started the program, you went for technical, vocational, formal skills. 
um, uh, and now you are saying it's very expensive, and that's so true. And now you'd like to uh, consider a community apprenticeship kind of approach. I just wanted to share with you that in Zimbabwe, we started with community apprenticeship. Uh, we assessed it at some point uh, because we were not happy. Number one, um, if I am an artisan, it doesn't mean that I am a teacher or, or I have capacity to transfer knowledge and skills to the next person, one. Number two, um, you are not going to, I'm not going to give you a certificate. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there's nothing that the girl has to show that now I know how to lay bricks. Someone took me through this. Um, uh, uh, number three, uh, you remain in the community, so you don't grow. And we believe in dreams that growth, if you want to grow, change your mindset, you might even change, you must uh, change your company, you might even change location as you grow. <laughs> but um, a community apprenticeship <laughs> meant that girls will remain uh, in the community. Uh, when it, so now the, the, the program we are implementing, we are taking girls to uh, formal institutions where they will sit uh, for a recognized exam and get a certificate. Believe you me, uh, all these institutions in different countries, if you engage them, they have courses for people with different qualifications. If you are half qualified, like we use what we call all levels, you might have two, you might have three, there's a course for you. Girls are better off in those courses. And sometimes, for example, some of our girls have done well in the institution, they've said these ones need to transition to a diploma. So you have to balance the cost and impact for the girls. Great, thank you for, thank you for sharing the lessons learned from, from Dream Zimbabwe as well. And we have just one minute left, so I want to give time um, I believe Adit had the last question on on the compensation or insurance, if you could answer that. Yeah, on the question related to compensation and insurance, we have a memorandum of understanding with the government institution which deals with the training, vocational trainings and compensations, all these, um, all these uh, issues that we're talking about. So before we start the internships, uh, we go to the to our partners, uh, our uh, partners uh, uh, with these institutions to ensure that they have um, all these um, uh, topics set set up. So, uh, of course, uh, the the, uh, the the private sector has have they as they um how can I say expectations because they uh, when we have an internship it means that you are not going to pay or you're going to pay less. So that's why we have, we go d with these uh, government institutions we who can ensure that uh, the girl is there and receive, some of them receive a, a, a salary, but uh, uh, some of them receive receive an, um, how can I say, subsidy, subsidy to go for that uh, internship. Um, on the question related <laughs> on to your comment, I totally agree. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we want to do now is to change our memorandum of understanding with this uh, training institution so that we can accommodate this different level of girls that we have. So they have a standard training. So we want to have trainings who can accommodate the girls who, for example, uh, didn't have uh, a secondary school, so they can uh, make more um, affordable or uh, trainings or prices that we can uh, pay for them. Thank you. So thank you so much to our panelists. Congratulations on your programs, your challenges, your lessons learned, your successes. Um, and for sharing all of those with us today. Thank you for your participation. Another round of thanks for our panelists. And you have eight minutes to move to your next session. Thank you.